introduction to electron probe X-ray microanalysis for or a EPMA. Uh, it's good to see a good turnout. We've got 107 people here. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so before uh, we move on to this topic, I'd like to quickly introduce myself. Uh, my name is uh, Jeff Chen, and I'm the electron microprobe uh, specialist at the Center for Advanced Microscopy, the Australian National University. Uh, unlike many electron microprobe operators who have an uh, earth science background, I was trained as a chemical engineer, or uh, more specifically, a metallurgical engineer. So after my PhD, I spent several years doing research in high temperature ex extractive metallurgy. Uh, during that period of time, I got really fascinated about how much extra information I can get for my research by using microanalysis techniques compared to many of the conventional you know, bulk chemical analysis techniques. So uh, a couple of years ago, I joined CAM and I'm now full, I'm now like full time in uh, implementing all these uh, advanced uh, techniques in both uh, earth science uh, research as well as uh, material science research. Okay, um, just a, a quick uh, introduction to the center itself. Uh, center for Advanced Microscopy is one of the nodes of uh, Microscopy Australia. Oh, someone's been scribbling. On the slide. Okay, all right, I'll move on. Um, so, uh, Center for Advanced Microscopy is one of the nodes of uh, Microscopy Australia, and we are located uh, within Australian National University in Canberra. We have a range of uh, microscopy and microanalysis within the center that are actually open to public. And I guess more importantly, we have a group of uh, dedicated specialists focusing on supporting researchers, both within the campus and from across the world. Okay, uh, today's talk on EPMA is only going to be a, at the very introduction level. So aspects we're gonna cover include uh, what's, what, what's the technique and uh, well, or what does it do? and very briefly on how does it work. Um, and we're gonna talk about the strength and the limitations of this technique. And uh, at the end of the presentation, I'd like to give a few examples on how it is used in research of different disciplines. Okay, EPMA generally refers to uh, wavelength dispersive spectroscopy, WDS, as opposed to energy dispersive spectroscopy, EDS. It is a SEM-based X-ray analysis technique. It is often used to quantitatively measure the chemical composition of a very small phase or feature. So here is an example. Uh, this basically is a backscatter electron image of a, a, a waste material produced in a smelter. So there are uh, features of different uh, contrast. Some of these features are rather very small. So for example, this little bright spot here is probably in the order of uh, two to three microns. So what EPMA analysis is able to measure is the chemical composition of these micro scale features. Uh, in most cases, this technique is non-destructive. Uh, which means that you can come back to reanalyze the same spots again and again. Um, any solid material that's uh, uh, stable under the high vacuum and is stable uh, when it's exposed to the electron beam could be measured. So the first EPMA was developed and has been extensively used in earth science and the material science research. Uh, in fact, nowadays uh, it has become an industry, industry standard for earth science research. So how does it work? This technique has many similarities to the uh, EDS, the Energy Dispersive Spectroscopy technique that my colleague Frank uh, talked about yesterday. Uh, I'm only gonna, uh, I'm not gonna uh, repeat what uh, Frank has already explained, 
for those who uh, like to have more details, uh, a recording of yesterday's talk will be uploaded to the uh, Microscopy Australia YouTube channel. So you can get online and uh, have a look at the uh, uh, talk by yourself. So as I mentioned earlier, so this technique is that NEM based. When uh, you have an electron uh, beam hits your sample uh, or your specimen, uh, many signals will actually emit from your uh, sample. Some of the uh, them are typically used for imaging purposes. For example, your secondary electron, secondary electrons, and the backscatter electrons. What we are interested in here are the actual X-rays, uh, which include characteristic X-ray, uh, which are the signatures of the elements present in your sample, and the continuum X-rays, which form a background. So the key difference between the EDS and the EPMA or WDS is really on how the X-rays are detected. For EDS, uh, all the X-rays emitted from the specimen uh, are collected simultaneously by the detector. So when you hit your sample with an electron beam, you, within a few seconds, you will get the full spectrum, uh, EDS spectrum. Uh, for WDS, there's a natural component, which is this uh, little diffraction crystal. The function of this crystal is to selectively diffract X-ray with the energy or the wavelengths that actually satisfy certain criteria. So uh, in order to actually collect the X-rays with the different energies, both diffracting crystal and the detector have to move uh, to different positions. For example, um, in order to detect um, one of the, uh, uh, some of the characteristic X-rays, so for example, calcium K-alpha, barium L-alpha here, and iron K-alpha, they all have a different energies. You have to move the crystals and detectors into three different positions. In this specific case, position one for calcium K-alpha, uh, position two for barium L-alpha, and iron K-alpha at the position three. So uh, really, some of you may start to think, oh, this sounds to be a very interesting method to EDS. We're going to address that uh, question a bit later. OK. Um, WDS measures the intensity of the characteristic X-rays of interest. For example, in this case, uh, we need to measure the lead, elemental lead L-alpha X-ray. And then what we need to do is to move the WDS spectrometer to the position that corresponds to the wavelength or the energy of lead L-alpha, which is this point A, and the detector will then start to determine the intensity of the X-rays uh, of that particular energy. But that's not enough. As I mentioned before, there's always a background generated together with the characteristic X-ray. We also need to determine this background X-ray intensity and then subtract it from the total intensity uh, to obtain the net intensity, which is the true intensity of the left alpha line. The way we normally measure the background is to move the spectrometer to a position uh, before, normally before and after the peak uh, A to point B and C. And measure the, uh, you have to make sure there are no other characteristic peaks present at those two positions uh, to actually measure the in background intensity. And then we can estimate the background intensity under the peak A by interpolating the intensity of B and C. So uh, some of you may start, start to say, this is even worse. I need to. <laughs> move the spectrometer to the three positions to just to get the net intensity of just the one element. I guess, you know, please be a little more <laughs> bit, bit, a bit patient so we will get to the benefits of the WDS very soon. Okay, so by comparing the net intensity of the uh, characteristic X-ray of an element in your unknown sample 
So this is the net intensity of the characteristic X-ray. Uh, to that of the same X-ray, that in a standard, a stand or a standard reference material, which concentration of that element of interest is actually known, plus applying a matrix correction factor, ZAF, you will be able to obtain the concentration of the element of interest here in your unknown sample. So this procedure is exactly the same as how quantitative EDS works. So if you, you know, are not familiar with all the details here, again, I refer you to you to uh, watch the video uh, or the talk that uh, we had yesterday, which is gonna be uploaded to the YouTube channel later. I'm not gonna repeat all that here. Now, let's do a quick comparison between uh, the EDS and the WDS, see whether it actually worth the extra, extra time to go, go to do some WDS analysis. Energy, energy resolution, which is the ability to, to distinguish the X-rays with the very similar energies. Uh, WDS is actually an order of magnitude better than EDS. Uh, not much of difference between, you know, in terms of uh, what elements it can be measured, they are very similar. Uh, detection limits. That's another thing WDS, I would say, completely destroys EDS. For minor or some trace elements, WDS is definitely the way to go. So, of course, the downside of the WDS is the slow da data acquisition, as I explained before. Uh, that's why most of the EPMA instrument is actually equipped with the four to five uh, WDS spectrometers. And uh, uh, often WDS re require more frequent uh, calibration compared to the EDS because it has, you know, the moving parts, the crystals and the detectors, they're all moving at the, time, at the same time. While compared to the EDS, you just basically get a detector sitting there not doing, you know, basically there's no moving bits. Uh, uh, a final point. In, in general, it's uh, relatively easy to actually publish the measurement results actually uh, obtained uh, by EPMA or WDS compared to EDS. This, again, largely depends on your research disciplines. If you submit a paper to a journal in a geological science research, you would definitely have a hard time to convince your reviewers to accept your results obtained by EDS. This does not mean that uh, the measurement results from EDS are necessarily worse than from WDS. Uh, it's just the perception that somehow formed within our research community that the WDS somehow is more accurate than EDS. All right, uh, let's do a, give an example, look at the comparison of uh, uh, the energy resolution of a, a WDS and an EDS. So this is an X-ray spectrum of a, a, a mineral called a barium uh, titanate. The barium L line, L alpha line, and the titanium K alpha line, they have very similar energies. So in the EDS analysis, you will see basically just a big hump uh, made of the two peaks. So to quantify barium and the tit titanium concentration using the EDS, that basically requires a, a interference corrections. But with the, with the WDS, you will see clearly those two energies, they were actually resolved. So there's no corrections required actually for, uh, for the quantification purposes. So this is one example on the energy resolution. And uh, now to put uh, things uh, in context. Uh, so this diagram, uh, basically shows the detection limits and the spatial resolution of base, both EDS and WDS relative to other analytical techniques. Uh, please note, this diagram is only, uh, gives you sort of like a ballpark in terms of the capabilities of all these, uh, of these uh, techniques. Uh, please do not take them quantitatively. Okay, so what sort of samples we can put in there? So as I mentioned before, pretty much uh, any solid materials that are stable under uh, a scanning electron microscope could be measured. 
Uh, in addition to that, for my uh, EPMA analysis, there are two more requirements. First, uh, samples, uh, they need to be very flat. So normally the samples are mounted in uh, epoxy resin, then grinded or polished, uh, either using a sandpaper and then, po a, and then a polishing media, uh, normally a suspended diamond to create a, create a mirror smooth like surface or something like that. Uh, and this step is a quite critical and can significantly affect the quality of the analysis results. Uh, second, if your samples are not uh, conductive, then they need to be coated uh, with an electron conductive layer. So for most of the microprobe or electron microprobe analysis, we use carbon. Here, what I'm showing is basically the, uh, the sample holders we have in our microprobe, in our electron microprobe. Uh, these sample holders, they are generally much bigger and take more samples at a time compared to normal SEM ones. So uh, these are two sample holders that we use at the CAM. Uh, one on the right can take up to, you can, you can count like a nine, one each, resin mounts. And the other one on the left is uh, they are used to, to hold geological thin sections, uh, something like that, uh, just basically a thin section, uh, a glass thin section. Okay, let's move to, uh, I believe the most important part of uh, EPMA analysis, quality control. Uh, when you get your analysis results, how do you know they are good? So there are basically three tests you could actually use to verify your results. First of all is by looking at the, the totals you are getting, so analytical totals. So typically, if the total of your analysis results are say between, I would say 99 to 100.5 weight percent, then they would be considered as a, a, you know reasonably good results. Um, I would like to point out you know, this total is not the normalized total uh, because I, I know a lot of you, they're uh, pretty used to, to uh, use an EDS where you get a little quant button when you press it, you get a beautiful uh, results. They all add up to 100%. So that's not the same thing here. So what I'm talking about the total here is the true totals. It's not normalized to 100%. Uh, because when you normalize everything to 100%, you, you will get 100% and you will never know how good your results are. So if the phase uh, you measured or the feature you measured is a line compound or a mineral of a set of uh, stock geometry, you often can also test how well your results, the results you get can fit into its uh, chemical formula. For example, for um, using an example here, it's called a mineral called olivine. Uh, it has a fixed uh, sort of formula, so which means that the, the atomic ratio between the two plus cations, in this case, iron plus magnesium, uh, and uh, four plus cation, which is the uh, silicon, is always two. So if you say, uh, get some measurement results, uh, which is very close to 100%, uh, plus that the it can actually fit into this formula very well, then you can be very confident that you're, you're, you're getting pretty good results. And uh, the third test uh, uh, we normally would do was to actually do a cross-checking with the secondary standards. What does it mean, does it mean by a secondary standards? So uh, there are materials or minerals out there, they have been well categorized, so their compositions are well known. And uh, you, in the microprobe analysis, we actually analyze them as unknown materials. So by looking at the results you get and see how close uh, the results you're getting are, are close to the, the reported or the certified values, well, that certainly would also uh, give you indication um, how accurate your, your, uh, your results are getting for your actual unknowns. So once you pass these three tests, uh, I would say I normally uh, are very conservative. You, you would uh, be fairly confident that uh, your results are, you know, 
not necessarily bad. <laughs> so in summary, I like to uh, highlight the strength of this technique. So it's a, a microanalysis technique and it provides the chemical composition of a very small area. It's capable of measuring uh, major and minor elements. It's also possible to do trace elements, uh, uh, you know, down to a very uh, low concentration level. Uh, and the third one is uh, it's a, it's a non-destructive method in most cases. Uh, at the same time, I'd like to also point out the, the weaknesses of this technique. Uh, you cannot measure the lightest elements. You know, for example, lithium, uh, hydrogen, uh, helium, and lithium. So it's impossible to measure in most of the electron microprobes. Uh, it, it will be also a challenge to measure some of the uh, other light elements, uh, basically uh, elements that sit on the second row of your periodic table. Things like a boron, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, uh, fluorine, for example. It's possible to analyze, to measure them, but the, uh, there's uh, challenges in there. So although it's, uh, this technique, WDS, has a much uh, better energy resolution compared to the EDS, the spectral interferences, they do occur, just like with many other uh, spectroscopic techniques. When it happens, interference corrections need to be applied. And uh, the last but not the least, uh, routine microprobe analysis cannot distinguish uh, the difference between, uh, uh, say, the uh, uh, same elements of the different valence states. For example, if you have a magnetite, if you know what I mean, it has both iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus. The, the, you cannot directly actually measure the you know, whether how much iron 2 plus is in that material and how much iron 3 plus in there. Okay, um, now let's look at some examples how this EPMA might be able to help you with your research. First, let's look at an application in earth science research. Um, we all know that the diamonds are formed under extremely high pressure and a high pro uh, and high temperatures. So, and they are transported to the surface of Earth by volcanic eruptions. Because the diamonds are so rare, so geologists often apply uh, something called the geothermal barometers to uh, common, more common minerals that are brought to the surface through the volcanic eruptions. Sometimes, possibly together with the diamond, to see how much heat and the pressure these minerals have been subjected to to determine if diamonds could actually form under these conditions. So it's very useful for diamond exploration. So we have uh, uh, researchers at the uh, ANU so, uh, working on developing these uh, uh, geothermal parameters by determining uh, small chemical variations in synthetic uh, uh, minerals experimentally. So here's an a, a example. So people have been experimentally basically determining the temperature and the pressure uh, dependence of uh, elements nickel distribution. So the nickel distribution between olivine, uh, a mineral called an olivine and another mineral called a garnet. Uh, this is some, this is, uh, some study already done before here on the right hand side of the slide showing the temperature, uh, how the temperature actually affects. So the, on the uh, x-axis is basically the temperature and the y-axis is the distribution coefficient between, uh, of nickel between uh, garnet and olive. So basically temperature would actually affect the distribution coefficient. Uh, so to be able to actually determine this uh, distribution coefficient, uh, nickel concentration uh, down to a few tens of uh, ppms in the mineral grains of this sort of size, let's say a few micrometers, need to be accurately measured. And uh, well, so far, the, the most efficient way to do that is through uh, the electron microprobe analysis. So this is one example. Uh, as another example in uh, material science research, 
there have been studies showing that uh, you know when you add minor elements, especially um, you know rare earth elements, into this uh, dielectric materials, would actually improve their properties. But how exactly they actually affect the properties of the materials are still not very clear. So here we're looking at uh, one of the, one of these uh, dielectric materials under SEM. Uh, first thing you will see is that the material itself consists of a number of different phases. So after conducting the EPMA analysis, you will see that uh, this particular uh, rare earth element, a half uh, it's segregated uh, actually in a particular phase here at very low concentration. We're talking about uh, 0.05 white percent or 500 ppm. Uh, the, where this little red arrow is pointing at. And uh, this little very low concentration half moon can be actually measured together with all the other elements actually present in this phase. So uh, I guess clearly understanding how these minor elements are distributed within the, the material would be certainly the first step towards uh, understanding how and why they are effective in these materials. Okay, let's, let's look at uh, one of my favorite examples. So this is a, a uh, secondary lead smelter uh, somewhere in Asia uh, that actually produced both uh, lead and the copper metal. So the feed material actually goes into this smelter is uh, very complicated in terms of its chemistry. So it contains copper, lead, sulfur, arsenic, iron, and all other elements. I'm not gonna list all of them here. So the, the actual smelting process undergoes two steps. The first step is called oxidative smelting here, which produce copper, so at the end of the oxidative smelting you would actually produce copper copper metal is coming out together with a, a, another material called a, a intermediate slag which essentially is a molten oxide glass the the rest the the, the rest of the material undergoes a, a basically a reductive smelting which produce metallic lead after the oxidative smelting, uh, ideally you want all the copper to separate from the slag phase and then remove as a copper metal, and all the lead to stay in the slag phase so it can be removed in the next uh, reductive smelting. So this diagram basically shows that after oxidative smelting, uh, uh, there's about 20% lead left in that uh, slag material, and there's also you know 2.1 about 2. 2% of the lead, copper left in the slag. So not really all the copper is removed. Uh, and this is basically a, a bulk analysis technique. So people just take these samples and for a, a bulk chemical analysis. And it doesn't really tell you why there's still you know, copper left in these slags. Uh, so we took some of the slag samples uh, after this uh, reductive smelting process and put them under the electron microprobe. First thing you will see again is this uh, slag samples they are, uh, have a few different phases, it's not just a single phase. By carrying out the EPMA analysis on the actual slag phase, so the dark uh, region, uh, you, you will see that the you know, the amount of copper dissolved in the actual slag phase is actually lower than what's reported into, you know, when you use bulk chemical analysis. Uh, uh, same thing happened to lead. So basically that shows that the, you know, when we, uh, when we did analysis uh, for other, other phases of other phases, it basically shows there are, still unreacted material. So where the feed you put in is still, is still there, not reacted. Uh, as well as some of the really, really small droplets of metal, these are called that in trend metal droplets. Uh, this certainly provides uh, extra valuable information to the process engineers when it comes to uh, decision making on how to improve the current process for a better, for example, uh, copper extraction. So how do you reduce that uh, you know, copper level in the slab phase. 
uh, after the initial step. And uh, you know, it's important that the process engineers understand whether these coppers they are dissolved or they actually in trend. So because they're going to take a completely different strategy to actually address those issues. For example, if you have a copper as an in trend, you probably want to have the slab to settle a bit longer. So all these uh, uh, copper, they can sort of settle down and uh, you know uh, gets tapped out together with the majority of the copper metal. However, however, if, if it is all dissolved, then obviously a different step has to be taken. So uh, that's very useful. So another thing I like to also point out is that uh, we have analyzed the 22 elements here all together with the electron microprobe. So many of these elements, they have very similar uh, extra energies. It will be very difficult to analyze with the EDS. So WDS here is actually able to measure them at the very low concentrations again with a little or almost no interference corrections. So at the end, finally, I'd like to show an uh, example of uh, using EPMA for mapping. So one of the advantages of using EPMA for mapping is that it can actually use, uh, the, it basically use a stage mapping modes as opposed to the beam mapping modes that often used uh, in EDS mapping. So basically this allows you to map, to map a much, much bigger area. And in theory, well, the area you can map is only limited by the size of your sample holder. So the sample, sample holder, we've got this probably in the range of uh, 10 times 10 centimeters. Uh, it's almost impossible to do in a normal SEM with the EDS attached to it. So here we basically mapped a, a piece of a, a steel. And then what we're interested in is the phosphorus distribution after some heat treatment. So from the map, we could clearly see that the, you know, uh, some of the, uh, uh, how the, how the phosphorus is basically redistributed after. So this is the zone got uh, basically affected. And this is a zone where there's not much of going on. So originally the phosphorus is more evenly distributed within the steel, but after the, the, the treatment, the phosphorus start to seg segregate in that sort of a funny way. And uh, well, of course, this potentially would have an impact on the mechanical properties of the material. So because of the concentration of the phosphorus is very low, uh, so this map did take a very long time to actually finish, but this is something we are able to do. So we're talking about the level of uh, 60 ppms on one of those uh, little uh, features here. Okay, that's pretty much everything I want to share with you today. So hopefully everyone would have a bit of understanding what EPMA is capable of uh, delivering at the end of this talk. And uh, I'm ready to take questions.